Well, I do hope some of you have watched the long interview with Dr. William Marcus, but for those of you that found it a bit long, I've just uh, taken a bit out of the bowels of the video. This was on uh, fenbendazole and a very similar drug, merbendazole, in his role in cancer. And we talk about the way that it's based on very firm science, known biochemistry. We're just lacking the clinical trials because there's no money in it. And we also mention the small cell lung carcinoma, which is a totally deadly form of cancer normally, that Joe Tippins was, uh, as far as we know, is still alive and, and, uh, and well. If Mr Tippins is watching, do, do let us know how you are now, sir. But let's watch this. Um, we really need to get our act together on repurposed drugs, start saving lives, start getting rid of a lot of human pain, suffering uh, and death. We need the research that answers our questions definitively. Um, that's how we get it. Let's watch the clip. Another antiparasitic, uh, fenbendazole or mebendazole. Now, this is a different family of antiparasitics than ivermectin. Fenbendazole was actually interestingly discovered by a terminal cancer patient uh, from Oklahoma, uh, Joe Tippins. And yeah. Joe Tippins yeah. had stage four small cell lung cancer, which is one of the most aggressive cancers uh, known. And he had stage four small cell lung cancer diagnosis, terminal diagnosis. And I, I believe he was, he was put on a trial of Keytruda at the time. And uh, is, that a a reg is that a regular cancer drug? It is a regular cancer yeah. drug. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and sort of what they call an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Yeah. And, and, um, so he was put on Keytruda and, and, and he tells the story later on that everybody on that trial died. He was the only one who survived. Um, and, he tells the story of, of, of how he had a friend who was a veterinarian who said, look, we, there's this parasitic drug, this dog dewormer called fenbendazole. Uh, it's been accidentally found to have anti-cancer properties in mice. It's cheap. It's, it's, it's safe to take. Why don't you, why don't you try it? And the story goes that, you know, he went, he tried this, this dog dewormer, dog medicine, I guess you could say. And he cured his stage four small cell lung cancer, which is completely unheard of. I think his, his, he was given a survival of less than 1%, you know, sort of a five year survival of less than 1%. And he's still here to this day, seven years later, he's cancer free with oh, a that's... stage four small cell cancer diagnosis. And so he, at the time, he would actually go on news, news uh, shows and talk about his experience of trying fenbendazole, which was not FDA approved for use in humans, uh, and how it cured his, his uh, or, or he believed that it cured his stage four cancer. Um, and, and then, you know, I look into that research, that body of research, see, again, there's a ton of preclinical research on yeah. fenbendazole, and there's now been cases published by Stanford University Medical Center of three patients who cured their stage four cancer with fenbendazole. And the Stanford group looked into it, analyzed it, you know, monitored these patients. These patients had all failed three or four lines of chemotherapy. They were terminal. They took fenbendazole and they are now cancer free. And the Stanford group published this. Now the Stanford group itself, they were not allowed. The researchers were not allowed to recommend that drug fenbendazole because it's not FDA approved. But they were at least, this is how, this is what I love about science is that they saw something fascinating. They saw something that they thought other doctors and scientists should know about, and they published it. And uh, they published this case series. You had actually talked about this. The, you, had, you, had, you had talked about this paper yeah, uh, from 2021, this, this series of, yeah. of three people who had cured their cancer with fenbendazole. And so there is an FDA-approved version of fenbendazole called mebendazole. Uh, there is, it's structurally almost identical. There's one atom difference between fenbendazole and mebendazole. Mebendazole has been approved by the FDA as an antiparasitic drug for use in children and adults. And so it, it has an, an incredible safety profile, very safe to use. And mebendazole actually has a dozen uh, clinical trials uh, in which it's being looked at as a, as a cancer agent, as a repurposed drug for cancer. And so I think because of its status as an FDA approved drug, there was much more willingness in the oncology community to do trials with it. And so there are trials in adults looking at colon cancer and various prostate cancer. And there's also trials in children looking at brain cancers with mebendazole. Um, and, and, and again, this is 
an antiparasitic drug that has a dozen mechanisms of action. One of the fascinating mechanisms of action in cancer is that it blocks glucose transporters on cancer mm. cells. And mm. so it, it sort of starves the cancer cell from being able to use glucose as a fuel source. Specifically in cancer cells and not on normal cells. Yeah, exactly. Glucose transporting in cancer cells. That's amazing. So there must be something biochemically different about the glucose transporter in cancer cells compared to ordinary cells that it's able to specifically target. Exactly. And what's fascinating about these repurposed drugs is they are very specific to cancer cells. They That's are amazing. able to yeah. somehow identify a, a cancer cell from from a normal cell. And, and, and this has been studied in ivermectin as well, is, is ivermectin is actually able to identify lymphoma cells and act on them. And it's able to also identify normal cells, and it doesn't have that same effect on the normal cells. Um, it's what we call a magic it, bullet. It, it is. It is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And, and I encourage anyone look. You know, look into the the preclinical research. It is. It is absolutely fascinating. And, and the, the 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 mechanisms that we're talking about here that you're talking about are based on known biochemical pathways. This this is not something new. This is this is understood biochemistry, and this interfe these these drugs interfere in. A particular biochemical mechanism in a, in a known biochemical way. This is not speculation. I mean, biochemistry is a biochemistry is basically a hard science. I mean, medicine's a bit soft around the edges, but 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 biochemistry is a hard science. It's it's bench chemistry, and uh, you can't re really argue with that. And the fact that it's got multiple mechanisms of action on multiple biochemical pathways, and that's true for ivermectin and the mebendazole fenbendazole group. That's it's right. just it's just absolutely incredible that these natural molecules seem to have these multiple modalities of action and yet uh, and yet we're staring the gift horse in the mouth exactly and, and and the research is very very solid uh yeah the research on the mechanisms the preclinical research is very solid this is not one or two papers this has been, you know, replicated. This is hundreds of hundreds of papers for these antiparasitic drugs. So, so this is not, you know, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is not. No. This is not fringe medicine. You know, hard, this is actually, hard science. This is, it's as hard is, as it gets. Absolutely. This is hard science, mm. um, and and I and I love, you know, I I'm, I'm always fascinated by 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 preclinical research because that is what we re that is what we stand on that is what the rest of medicine stands on is is the preclinical research that's what we rely on as as physicians and that's what uh, gives us the plausible mechanisms of action because if you can't give a plausible mechanism of action well you're not fulfilling an essential bradford hill criteria apart from anything else but you know if you can say well this is the way it's working then th that's what takes you into science away from mumbo jumbo because absolutely. we've got we've got existing science and this the, the, this pharmacodynamic effect the way this drug is working is dovetailing with what we already know with multiple points of consistency with what is already known exactly and and so i found myself in a situation where i was writing articles on 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 substack i was writing articles about turbo cancer potential mechanisms uh you know we talk about this brand new pathophysiology of turbo cancers and so uh, I have I have a paper uh, that I co-authored uh, on the IgG4 shift uh, that could be one of the potential causes of turbo cancer, um, where we see uh, someone who's had let's say multiple vaccines, they they end up with an, an immune uh, immune system shift where they start producing different types of antibodies, and instead of producing IgG1 and three, they start producing IgG4 which is an antibody that creates tolerance to something like the spike protein, but uh, it also starts to tolerate cancer. Uh, and, and so I've, I've, I've been, you know, I've been involved in some of this research uh, in trying to figure out the mechanisms, but now I'm shifting towards, I'm shifting towards treatment and I'm shifting towards looking at, well, can we help patients with turbo cancer? How can we help them? Yeah. Uh, and certainly, you know, I, I encourage everyone to pursue all the options in mainstream oncology, you know, pursue all the options, whether it's chemotherapy, radiation therapy, immunotherapy, you know, you have to pursue all those options. You have to have those discussions with your oncologist, but what else can you do? Uh, what if you're out of options? What, what other options are there? And I think this area of repurposed drugs, you know, is something that, that we can try 
as clinicians, uh, something that we can uh, look into, uh, advise patients on. And a lot of patients themselves are, you know, they, they look at look at some of these uh, repurposed drugs, and and they start taking them. They they start, you know, they start taking them themselves. So as I was writing about, uh, as I was writing about ivermectin and fenbendazole and mabendazole in cancer. I had patients who actually started taking them, and then they would come back to me six months later and say, Dr. Mackis, you know, I read your articles and I, I took these on my own. Um, you know, there was no patient you know, doctor relationship or anything like that. They took them on their own and they come back to me and they say, my cancers are shrinking. Um, my oncologist is shocked. My oncologist told me I shouldn't be alive anymore and yet I'm here, my cancer is stable. Uh, and so I keep, I kept getting story after story, you know, and one or two stories you say, that's fantastic. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really happy for you that, you know, that's really terrific. Uh, but when you get a dozen or two dozen stories like that, and that's what happened to me is I started having so many patients coming back to me that I thought, you know, there, there, there's something here where I could actually be helping patients with. I could be helping them with ivermectin. I could tell them about the side effects, potential side effects. I could guide them in dosing, for example. Mm -hmm. How do you dose these things, right? How do you find the appropriate dose for the appropriate condition? Mm -hmm. And so this is what I've been working on for the last two years. I did start a cancer clinic or, or sort of a cancer coaching or health coaching program with repurposed drugs where um, you know, I, I have clients, cancer clients that come to me, we discuss the research, we look at the research, um, and we talk about repurposed drugs and what repurposed drugs they might use and want to try themselves. And, and, and so this is where I've been trying to go from just identifying the problem, saying, look, we've got this explosion of cancers, these turbo cancers, aggressive cancers, to actually helping patients and give them some options that they can use. And I've had some fascinating results. Uh, patients, I've had uh, you know, a number of stage four pancreatic cancer patients who've been now declared cancer-free, cholangiocarcinoma patients, ovarian cancer patients whose tumors are shrinking, uh, even though they failed multiple lines of chemotherapy. And I mean, so, these are cancers that were absolute death sentences. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and another feature I wanted to just uh, mention um, is that these repurposed drugs, when you look at the preclinical research, they have synergy with chemotherapy. They have synergy with immunotherapy uh, and even radiation therapy in some cases. And no, when I, was I, am I was amazed at the radiotherapy one, that you can actually sensitize a drug to uh, sensitize a cell to uh, radio induced cell death is just incredible it's just brilliant it's it's fascinating you know because because you know, when you look at some of these mechanisms some of them are known and some of them are still unknown and yes and you see, you see all these all these <laughs> path, all these all these biochemical pathways that ivermectin acts on mm. and all these pathways where you know it, it it changes the expression of certain proteins and then suddenly mm. you you stimulate apoptosis of, yeah. of the cancer cell the, the right? cell just goes pop and dies Exactly, the, yeah. the, the, the programmed cell death. And, and so a lot of these pathways that ivermectin, fembendazole, and mabendazole act on are pro-apoptotic pathways, mm. uh, where you are, you're bringing that cancer cell towards this programmed cell death. And you're also, you know, this idea of, of, of being able to remove drug resistance, a, a cancer cell that has developed drug resistance, to me is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, how, how can you possibly reverse that? That's just, it's just, I mean, it's wonderful, but it's... Uh... It's biochemistry well beyond my level of understanding, that's for sure. It really is. <laughs> it's pure biochemistry. And it, yeah. it, it's, sometimes even I have a hard time understanding some of these pathways, you know. But I, I certainly uh, do, yeah. But, but it really, it, you know, the fact that it, it can affect expression of certain proteins and so Amazing. on, it, it's just, it just, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. And, and so it, I think repurposed drugs, I think there's, there's a big future in repurposed yeah. drugs. Uh, and, and I think repurposed drugs can give patients hope yeah. in situations that are very dire and, and, and were in the past would be considered hopeless. Um, and and know, we're, de we're, we're dealing with drugs that are very safe, very limited side effect profile, can nearly always be given with all, all the regular, what you might call standard cancer treatments. Exactly. And, and, and for people who've exhausted the standard cancer treatments, stage four pancreatic cancer, for example, um, 
uh, why not why not try exactly. something that's not going to do you any harm you know if you want to change the brand of whiskey that you drink in the last days of your life then then fine fine try it you know and uh, but but something like this that is potentially uh can potentially improve the condition is 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 is, is just incredible and i am optimistic again in, in the states that, that the right to try is going to be uh, reintroduced uh that people who are terminal can basically try whatever they want and i agree with that um one of the things i always used to teach my students was in, in acute care some page sometimes patients are going to die and you you always have to be in a position where you can walk into the relatives you can tell them about this tragic death and you can say we tried absolutely everything at our disposal now that's not always true tragically but we should always work to that situation we tried absolutely everything we've got in 2025 nothing else we could have done and so many people are dying now and that is not that cannot be said you're absolutely and, right uh, I, 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 I'm trying not to get cross now, but, but um, it's, it's, it's just right. not acceptable.